Good morning. Oh, thank you. Uh, sit down. I agree the Chiefs are going to win. I'm excited too. Thank you guys for being just as excited about the Chiefs as I am. Man, it's great to see you guys. I've been here the last few weeks. If you're new to Reach or haven't been here in a while, this is my first Sunday to preach since being diagnosed with COVID pneumonia. And I spent about 11 days in the hospital. And uh, I recently visited my doctor this week. And he said, let's see if you can go back and preach a couple times. And he said, let's just try you sitting down for the first little bit, and so I'm going to try this for a little bit to see how this works. Amen? Amen. And so it's really exciting to be here, to be honest with you. Uh, if I can encourage you with one thing, it's my first Sunday back, help me preach this morning, okay? Amen. Don't get quiet on me. I want you to shout amen. amen. <laughs> Put your hands together and clap. Yeah. Um, because, oh man, that is brutal, isn't it? Is it just as brutal? I'm going to do what I don't normally do, and that's use a handheld, and I hate the handhelds. Check. Microphone check. Oh man. Well, it's been quite the journey. Uh, I won't go into all the details. Maybe some point I will. But I can remember at one point being in the hospital, it happened several times to me. They had told me this is all they could do. And I remember at one point after being told that, I think it was my, I can't remember, my second or third time, I grabbed my phone and I started doing what nobody wants to do, and that's recording messages to Sarah, to Jackson, Ava, to let them know that I loved them, that everything was going to be okay. Without a doubt, it was the scariest and lowest point of my life. A lot of time in the hospital, to be honest with you, I really can't remember. But there's a few things that I can remember very vividly. And one of them is when I realized that Sarah was going to be able to come see me. I would literally stare at the clock in my room all night long, and I would count down the hours until she got there. She would come, and it was a miracle because she was only allowed to stay by paper for two hours. But there wasn't a time that she didn't come and didn't stay for probably five hours. Disfavor. And I remember that she would come the whole time that she was there, and she would read healing scriptures over me. And then she would declare according to Psalms 118, that I would live and I would not die. I'm convinced the day that she was allowed to come visit me is the day that things begin to change. So I want to take one moment and publicly thank you for fighting for me, for our family, and our church while I was in the hospital recovering. I love you and I appreciate you so much. And to my sweet little girl in here, I love you so much, Ava Grace. She has been the sweetest thing since I got home and always been protecting me ever since I've been home. And she said, everybody be nice to Dee Dee. I love you, baby. I want to thank everyone who prayed for me, bought us a meal, a gift card, 
sent a text or checked on us. I truly believe I wouldn't be here today if you guys in this church wouldn't have prayed for me. I want to thank the board for their support during this time. Ronnie, Farron, Terry, and Rick, I truly love and appreciate you, and I truly appreciate all your support. Lastly, I want to thank the staff. I'm so thankful for all that you guys did for me personally and for what you did for this church while I was off. I know this church wouldn't be where we are today without all that you did. Ashley, Braden, Becca, John Mark, Stephanie, and Captain Corey. Congratulations, by the way. Those of you who don't know, Corey just passed, and he is now an official captain. Thank you guys for everything that you did to keep this church moving while I was out. I truly appreciate everything that you guys have done and are doing. Amen. Do you guys mind standing to your feet this morning? We're going to look at the verses that we're going to read for this series. We're starting today, and I decided to call it, The Best is Yet to Come. I haven't spoken in a while, so I'm going to make up for lost time, because I'm going to use a lot of verses this morning. Amen? John 2, but I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to read the easy-to-read version. (laughs) Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Canaan and Galilee. Any single people in the room say amen. Say, I believe. And Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his followers were also invited. I realize that Jesus is the one who started social media. He had followers. All right, I'm trying. It's, it's early. Give me a drink. That is a little rough. At the wedding, there was not enough wine. To all you wine people, say amen. Oh, my gosh. You guys responded better than that than the other single marriage part. Holy cow, we'll do a sermon on that in a few weeks, apparently. So Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. He said, dear woman, why are you telling me this? It's not my time yet for to begin my work. His mother said to the servants, do what he tells you. There were six large stone water pots that were used by the Jews in their washing ceremonies. Each one held 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them to the top. Then he said to them, now dip some water and take it to the man in charge of the feast. So they did what he said. The man charged, tasted it, but the water had become wine. He didn't know where the water came from. But the servants who brought the water knew. He called the bridegroom and said to them, people always save the best wine for first. People always serve the best wine first. Later when the guests are drunk, they serve cheaper wine. But you have saved the best wine until now. The title of my message this morning is this. You saved the best for last. How many believe that he saved the best for last? How many truly believe that the best is yet to come for you personally? Amen? Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for what's taking place. And God, we thank you for this time. Lord, as we bring your word, God, I ask you just to use me. Use me to challenge them. Use me to bring change in their lives. And, Father, we thank you for that. In Christ's name. Everybody said? Amen. Turn around, sit, greet somebody, and say, the best is yet to come, and you may be seated. Amen. This story in John is one of my favorite Bible studies when it comes to Jesus. It shows us the humanity of Jesus But also, listen to me, shows that he is God and nothing with him is impossible. Remember, I said it's my first thing back. Don't be quiet. I said with him, nothing is impossible. They told me I wasn't going to make it. But here I am preaching the word of God this morning to you. And I believe the best is yet to come. Just a little context to help you what we read in John. In the Jewish culture, the wedding ceremony that Jesus is attending is a very, very big deal. Most translations tell us in verse 1, as you read it, it says, on the third day. 
Now, to you and I, that doesn't mean a lot. But to a Jewish person who read that, it would mean a lot to them. And let me explain why to you. The third day is the only day in creation when God was creating the world that twice that he said it was good. Twice. On the third day, after he did it, he said it was good twice. So listen to this. So the Jewish people would always plan their weddings on the third day because they realized that that day was special and they could be doubly blessed. How cool is that? So that's just the context of kind of what we're reading there. This allowed people also to travel after the Sabbath to arrive in time for the wedding. The wedding party would last anywhere from three to seven days. The wedding was a huge opportunity for people to get together, family and friends, and they would have a great time. Can somebody say amen? I love the fact that we see a 30-year-old Jesus still being told what to do by his mom. I kind of picture the conversation like this. Jesus, I don't care if you're the son of God, you will obey your mother. And then I hear her saying something like this. You don't need to worry about dying on the cross if you don't listen to what I tell you to do. You came into this world, I will take you out of this world. I can picture all the disciples sitting there thinking, this is awkward. But let's be honest, if you know anything about Peter, Peter piped up and said, bro, you better listen to your moms. We've seen her, and she can get very, very angry. How many know we're just having a little bit of fun? But that's exactly what Jesus and his disciples were doing that day at the wedding. And that's why it's one of our core values at REACH is that we will have fun. Can somebody say amen? I believe that we have painted the wrong picture when it comes to Jesus. Most pictures that you see of Jesus, he's really staunch. He doesn't have a smile on his face. But how many know that's not the Jesus that we would know? The Jesus that we would see today would have a big smile on his face and he would be happy and he would probably come up to you and he'd probably give you a big chest bump right in the middle of church. When we said turn around and greet somebody, you know I could see Jesus running through the aisles and high-fiving people. I know that offends some of you, but it's true. I could see Jesus on the dance floor with Farron Kelly. I could see Jesus and Farron singing Shorty had them apple bottom jeans with the boots with the fur. And as Farron got down, he would go low, 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 low. Okay, maybe he wouldn't be singing that particular song. But I believe that he definitely would be dancing with you, Farron. I better move on before somebody gets mad. How do we make sure that the best is yet to come in our lives? I want to give you four things that can assure that you will see the best things happen in your life. Can somebody say amen to that? So I encourage you to write these down. Number one, have fun. It doesn't specifically mention that they had fun in this context of this verses. But after I told you what I just did about a, a wedding in Cana in Galilee... How many know they would be having a lot of fun? It would be a big celebration. And I encourage you this morning, you need to learn to have a little bit more fun. Ecclesiastes 8.15 says this, Then I decided to spend my time having... I decided to have my time having what? You mean the Bible actually exhorts us to have fun? Truly, if you think about it, as Christians, we should be having the most fun of anybody out there. We have the hope of the world. When I was in the hospital and I didn't think I was going to make it, I promise you I wasn't checking my banking accounts. I wasn't looking at the attendance of the church while I was in the hospital. You know what I was doing? I was asking the Lord to give me more time to make more memories with Sarah Jax and Ava. That's what I was doing. 
Life is too short. And how many know we aren't promised tomorrow? Decide that you're going to have fun and make as as, many memories as you can with your friends and your family. You need to have fun. Matthew 6, 27 says this. Can any one of you by wearing add a single hour to your life? Where are my warriors at? Come on, don't be. You're gonna, right now you're worrying what people think about you if you raise your hand. I hate to admit this on stage, but man, I am naturally a worrier. I worry about everything. And I realize that during this time is that I have to change that. Worrying doesn't change anything. The only thing it does is robs us of our time here on earth. Worrying doesn't change anything, and it's biblical. All the things that we worry about, is it going to change? You know what can change it? Faith. Worry doesn't change anything. Faith can change everything. Let me say that again. Worry can't change anything, but faith can change everything. And if I can be honest with you this morning, the last few years have been difficult for me personally. I lost my mom first, and then I lost my grandma, and then I lost my stepdad who raised me as a kid. And then through all of that, we had several staff transitions and things going on. And if I'm honest, I just didn't grieve properly over my mom with everything that was taking place. And something inside of me, if I could just be totally transparent with you this morning, became numb. And there are certain things in me that just probably just died inside. And how many know, if you're not careful, it's the worry of this life that robs us of everything. I was so worried about what everybody was going to think and what it was taking place and all these things. And I was trying to do all these things and I forgot about the most important thing. Jesus. He's the one who sustains me. He's the one that keeps me going. I've got to learn that it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The only thing that matters is what he says. You should post that. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It only matters what he says. Amen? I wish I could tell you I'm perfect at this, but I'm not. But I am going to work on this. While I was in the hospital, I realized all the things that I was worried about for the last two years really didn't matter. Only thing it has done is rob me of my time with my wife and with my kids and friends and really times of this church. But here's what I know. Things begin to change. And when I realized that I was been given a second chance, that's where this series came from. God began to speak to me not only for this me personally, but for us as a church. The best is yet to come. And I realized that I needed to go back and do the basics. I know maybe some of you are sports people, maybe some of you are not. But one of the things that you'll do, if you start to lose consecutive games, the coach will begin to talk to you about doing the basics. And how many know you can't do algebra if you don't know the basics in math? The basics are where it's at. And sometimes as Christians, we have to learn to get back to the basics. And I believe one of the things that this church was established on was that we like to have a lot of fun. And we had a lot of fun reaching people for Jesus Christ. And I told the Lord when I knew I was coming home, I said, you know what, God, you give me a second chance. Father, forgive me. I want to go back to having fun. And so I'm here to tell you this morning, I believe the best days for us as a church are yet to come. Can somebody shout amen to that? Will you throw those verses of John back up there real quick, Greg? I want to look at these, and I want to jump on there. Here's the second thing that we can see. It says, two days later there was a wedding in the town of Caleb in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his followers were also invited. So that showed me the second thing that we must do to experience 
the best is yet to come. And this is this. Invite him. Write that down. The second thing you must do is invite him. Jesus and his disciples wouldn't have just showed up at this wedding. They are not Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. (laughs) Jesus is not a wedding crasher. He was invited to this wedding. And so, therefore, he was there. And that got me thinking. I wonder what areas of your life you haven't invited him to play a part. Yeah, you've made him Lord. And that's great. You're going to heaven. But what other areas of your life have you not invited him to play a part in? How about your thought life? Is he Lord? What about your marriage? Have you invited him to that area? What about work? How about your friendships? I hate to say this in church, but what about your finances? We'll move on. If you want all that God has for you, then you need to invite him into every area of your life. Some of you won't experience all that God has for you because how many know he's a gentleman? He's not going to come crashing in and take over. He wants to be invited just like he was to this wedding. So my question is, what area of your life are you not inviting him to play a part in? Let's look at the next one. Throw John back up there if you would, Greg. They also invited, so at the wedding there was not enough wine, so Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. As I read that, I realized this. Here's the third thing that we must do to make sure that we experience the best is yet to come. Be proactive. Be proactive. Did you notice that Mary didn't wait for the master of the ceremony or the bride or groom to come tell them that they were out of wine. As soon as she heard, I want you to notice something. Where did she go? My question for you this morning is where do you go when you know there's a need in your life? In those times, it was part that she should have went to the master of ceremonies and said, hey, just so you know, you have ran out of wine. But she knew that if he was going to get this need met, that she had to go to Jesus. You and I have been looking to the world to fulfill certain needs that only Jesus will able to meet in your life. If you're going to be experienced, the best is yet to come. In your faith, you're going to have to learn to be proactive. Write this down. Too many Christians are being reactive in their faith and not proactive. Too many Christians are being reactive in their faith, not proactive. What do I mean by that? You're waiting for something to happen to you before you start to build your faith for it, and that's not good. 1 Timothy 6.12 says this, we have to fight to keep our faith. Notice the Bible says we're in a fight. So here's my question for you. If we are in a fight, when is the best time to prepare for a fight? Anybody remember Mike Tyson? That dude was bad. I loved watching Mike Tyson fight. Most of the time, it was a very quick fight. But just imagine for me this. Mike Tyson went up there. They went to weigh in. And the guy that was about to fight Mike Tyson didn't make weight. Do you think anybody in their right mind would accept that fight on one day's notice? Anybody? 
I did some research, and I realized they said that the typical training camp for a boxer to prepare for a fight is about 10 to 12 weeks. And that's the minimum camp to get ready. You know why? They realize that they have a chance to win. They need to be prepared. Why as Christians don't we realize this? Let me say that again. Why aren't we prepared? The Bible clearly tells us we're in a fight. We need to be prepared. We have an enemy, right? He's out to destroy us, the Bible says. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How many of you guys have an alarm system at your home? Raise your hand. Give an alarm system. You know why? You're prepared for somebody to come into your house. Listen to me. If you do that in the natural, you need to do the same thing in the spiritual. You need to prepare for the enemy. He's trying to come into your house. And we have the best system that you could get. And his name is Jesus. It's the best thing that you could ever do. So my question for you is this. Are you being prepared for the fight you're in or the one that was coming? Are you prepared for the fight that you're in right now with the enemy or the fight that is coming? Because how many know that if you serve Christ long enough, the enemy's coming your way? But here's the good news. You fight from a place of victory. Let me say that again. You fight from a place of victory, but you will never know that unless you get into the Word of God. That's why so many Christians are walking around defeated today when Christ has already defeated the enemy. we got to learn to be proactive in our faith, not just waiting for something to happen. How many of you guys right now have a spare tire in your car? You're waiting for something to happen. You're prepared for it to happen. Listen, in this world, you will have tests and trials and difficulties. That's Jesus speaking, not me. But have faith, because I have overcome. You may not realize this, but you have a spare tire. His, it's the Holy Spirit. He's with you all the time. You think you're broke down on the side of the road? Absolutely not. But how many know that tire won't change itself? You got to get out. You got to get the jack. Or some of you just got to call AAA. But at least you did something. Huh? If you're waiting to build your faith and healing until you're sick, it could be too late. If you're waiting to build your faith concerning your finances until you have a need, it could be too late. If you're waiting to pray over your marriage and your kids, it could be too late. You need to be proactive in these things. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, now faith, so everybody say it loud, so now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we Did you see it? Notice the Bible says it's now faith. It's not later faith. It's not you're going to have faith one day. It says that it's now faith. And how many know you need faith now? Listen to me. You don't need faith once you get to heaven. You need faith while you're alive on earth. And you've been given faith. And now you get a choice in what you do with it. Develop it. But some of you are not experiencing victory in your lives because you're waiting too late to use your faith. And when the enemy comes, it's too late. And then you're trying to get yourself out of a hole. Tell both of your neighbors, say, we need faith now. Let's look at the final thing that we can see in the scripture. If you'll throw that back up there, Greg. John. And he said to him, 
Jesus answered, uh, dear woman, why are you telling me this? Is not my time yet? Next verses. His mother said to the servants, do what he Tell both of your neighbors, do what he tells you to do. Say that again. Do what he tells you to do. So number four is this. Obey him. Obey him. Tell both of your neighbors, say, obey him. Mary simply says, do whatever he tells you to do. You know what I found? Sometimes we don't like what Jesus tells us to do. Let me give you a perfect example. Love your neighbors. Forgive those who've hurt you. Huh? We got to obey them. How many know it's easy to obey on the good stuff? But how many know he's asking for full obedience? Remember, we talked about number two is invite him in. You now, you invite him in, you're making the Lord of not some areas of your life, you're making him the Lord of every area of your life. And that means you have to fully obey him in every area of your life. How many know that's easier said than done? How many has ever been hurt before? Huh? Man, forgive them? Can I punch them first? Right? I mean, I'll forgive them afterwards. But then I started realizing that people who live in glass houses shouldn't have rocks. Who am I not not to offer somebody forgiveness after all that I've done? Huh? Isn't that what Jesus said? Don't you want to know what he wrote in the dirt that day? For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the lady who was brought to him who committed adultery. And the Bible says that they all came and they're all like, Hey, we've caught her in the act. Did you ever think about that? They caught her in the act? What the crap were they doing? You talk about peeping Tom. I'm like, bro, what do you mean you caught her in the act of adultery? You should be home watching Netflix. Don't you got something better to do than walking around? And they brought her in. They said, Jesus, we caught her in the act of adultery. Moses says that she should be murdered. The Bible says he wrote, he got down. And he started writing in the dirt. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote in the dirt, but I have a pretty good idea. Then the most brilliant response was this. Him without sin, let him cast the first stone. Who was the first purple to le- who was the first people to leave the scene? There was older people and younger people at the scene. What does the Bible say? Who was the first people to leave the scene? Look it up. Homework for you. It was the older people. They were wise. They realized how many sins they had in their life. But then Jesus makes another statement that blows me away. Neither do I condemn you, but don't sin anymore. You want to know how you handle people's sins? There it is. Love and grace. Love and grace. How many know they would never experience this miracle if they wouldn't have obeyed him? Do you know what those water pots that they use to turn the water into wine was? It was for their feet. It was the dirty water. Because unlike us, when they would arrive, how many know they'd be walking 
for miles, some of them, and they'd be walking on gravel and stuff. And this water they had set aside was ceremonial washing. They would wash their hands. They'd wash their feet. And so this water they used wasn't the best. And, and that's the water that Jesus chose to turn into wine. You know what that does? That gives me hope that Jesus can bet, use me because I'm jacked up. Huh? I don't know about you, but I am a dirty, broken water vessel. And it gives hope to know that Jesus uses people like me. That means he'll use people just like you. And here's the thing. Catch this. It doesn't make sense. Go dip water out of those jars. Jesus, I told you we were out of wine. How many of you have ever argued with Jesus when he's told you something to do? Naaman, you want to be healed? Go dip in the water seven times. No. Why did I come all the way over here when I've got pretty of beautiful waters, and you sent me all the way over here to the Jordan, one of the nastiest waters there is, and you told me I have to dip seven times? I thought he would just lift up his hand and pray for me, and I would be healed. How many know we will get mindsets of how we think Jesus should do the miracles in our lives? What you need to be concerned with is obeying him, even when it doesn't make sense to you. If they wouldn't have obeyed him, they wouldn't have experienced the miracle. Some of you are not experiencing the miracle or the breakthrough because you're not obeying him. Oh, let me preach some of it over here. I'm going to stand up, I think. I said some of you are not experiencing the breakthrough or the miracles in your life simply because you're not obeying him. Oh, man. Let me sit back down and prove it to you. Deuteronomy 11.27. There will be blessings if you... What? Obey. Huh. Isaiah 1.19. If you are willing and... Huh. Write this down. I found this. Most people are willing, very few are obedient. Let me say that again. Most people are willing, very few are obedient. But the Bible says that you have to be willing and, willing and, How many know we want God to bless our marriages? Everybody say amen. But are you willing to pay the price it's going to take to have a blessed marriage? How many of us want godly kids? Are you taking the time to raise them in church like the Bible says you should then? Are you making sure your teenagers are here on Wednesday night? Train them up in the way they should go and what? You know what they're saying is? You're willing, but are you willing to be obedient as well? Huh? Should we say it? We're on our way to roll this morning. You guys ready? How many want God to bless us financially? Man, let's come on. Let's be honest. How many who are willing for God to bless you? Are you being obedient to tithe? And let me just say, tithing is not the only answer. Being a good steward, saving your finances and doing that, all of those things. But how many know, God, we are willing, oh, Lord, bless us. Bless my finances. If I see one more person type amen on a shared post, if you put amen that you're going to be blessed, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> Share this. And you will be blessed. No, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to learn to be obedient to the word of God. And not just finances. Every area of your life. Every area. I'll prove it to you biblically. Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. But Jesus said, the people who hear the teaching of God and... 
obey it, they're the ones that what? Remember, let's do a poll just for fun. How many of you guys want God's blessing on your life? Honestly, we're not going anywhere until everybody raises their hand because everybody in this place should raise their hand. How many want God's blessings on your life? Then what do we got to do? Obey them. What's he saying to you in the area of your life that you're struggling with? The answer is right here. See, we're not coming from a place of defeat. We're coming from a place of victory. And that, you got to make sure I hear, make that clear this morning. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that's alive in us. And because of that, all things are possible with him. Now, you know, no, you don't say amen like that. I said, all things are possible with him. How? We obey him. I'll close with one last scripture and thought. Worship team, you can join me back on stage. You guys okay this morning? Do you still miss me? <laughs> Are you still glad that I'm preaching? <laughs> well, I'm not done yet, so. Thank you. It's biblical. James 1.25. But if anyone keeps looking steadily into God's law for free men, he will not only remember it, but he will do what it says. And what? I want you to read it for yourself. How many want God to bless you in everything that you do? The Bible says everything we put our hands to shall prosper. You know how you make sure you're experiencing that in your life? Obedience. Obedience is the key. Do what he says, and God will greatly bless him in what? In everything that he does. Write this down. Your breakthrough and your miracle on the other side of your obedience. Stand up in that. Have you write that down? I want you to think about that. Write that down. Some of you don't know what to do. Stand up or write it down. You can do both. Let me say that again. Your breakthrough and your miracle are on the other side of your obedience. If you want to make sure that the best is yet to come in your life, then let me remind you of the four things that you must do. And if you didn't take notes, this is where you can cheat, pull out your phone and write these down. Number one, we got to learn to have fun. Huh? Let's have some fun. Number two, invite them in of every area of your life. Not some areas, but every area. Number three, we've got to learn to be what? no longer going to react we're going to be proactive and finally I think it's probably the most important one next to inviting him I should say that I believe that inviting him is the key to all of this the truth and then once you invite him the most important thing you can do is obey him We're going to go back into worship. 
And I'm going to ask you, unless you've got to get to work or you have to leave, if you would just close your eyes. Everybody in this place, just simply close your eyes. Nobody looking around. Nobody moving. If you've got to get to work, I'm going to give you your pass right now. They're going to begin to sing. And here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you to stick with us. No look around. I want you to engage in worship. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit time to speak to you about what of these four that you need to learn to implement in your life. How many know the Holy Spirit speaking? Brayton did this Wednesday night. I thought it was great. He gave the opportunity for the teenagers to actually wait and to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying to them. How many know he is speaking if we're listening? That's the key. So here's what we're going to do. Nobody looking. Nobody moving. Go ahead, guys. You begin to worship. And I want you to just give him a few moments and see what he's saying to you in what areas that we just heard from the Holy Spirit that you need to implement in your life. Thank you for watching the Reach Church YouTube channel. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram. Hit the subscribe button and share this video with a friend. You can also support the ministry by visiting reachchurch.us give to help us continue reaching and equipping people. Thanks again for watching and God bless.